Mara Thomas, Editor-in-Chief of UrbanHealthToday.com, part of the DocWire family of medical news sites. And I want to thank you for tuning in to Urban Health Weekly. Our goal each week is to keep you informed of the latest in health and medical news right from today's headlines. It's time to empower yourself with open conversations about your medical care with news that matters to you. So are you ready? Let's get started. This is Urban Health Today, and I'm speaking with Dr. Sadie DeBrosi, Medical Director of Genetic Testing and Ecology Imaging for Evelyn. She's here to talk about genetic testing and its impact on women's health. Thanks for being here today, Dr. DeBrosi. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. Let's begin. Please tell us about your background and your work with Evelyn. Absolutely. So my clinical background is as a pediatric oncologist. Um, So I am clinically trained in taking care of children, young adults, and adolescents with cancers. And then my uh, clinical focus has has been more on children and adolescents and young adults with solid tumors, as opposed to leukemias and lymphomas. I, um, at Evelyn, am the medical director of our genetic testing program. And while that may seem like a little bit of a funny fit to be a pediatric oncologist and work in a genetic testing program, the, the vast majority of, or a large proportion of genetic testing right now is focused on cancer patients. So both genetic testing that is looking at whether or not an individual has a change in their personal genes that make them at higher risk of developing certain cancers, mm-hmm. and also genetic testing of cancer cells themselves. So once someone has developed a cancer, there's genetic testing that can be done on their tumors. And so that's the work that I do at Evelyn right now. Can you give an overview of genetic testing in oncology? How is it currently used? Absolutely. So as I just alluded to briefly, there are kind of two lanes or paths of genetic testing in cancer that are important to understand. The first and the one that I think the general population is more familiar with is the genetic testing of the human or the individual looking to see if they have a change in any of their genes that make them more likely to develop cancers. And we call those cancer predisposition genes or cancer predisposition syndromes. So that means that an individual has developed a change in a gene that's throughout their whole body that is an important part of regulating how their cells grow um, and divide. So cancer predisposition genes are ones that are important for controlling either how quickly a cell grows or how quickly it dies. When an individual has a mutation in one of those changes or a change that makes the the protein or the product of that gene not function well, they are at a higher risk of developing cancers, depending on which particular gene is changed. So that's, again, what I think of, we call it germline cancer predisposition testing, or when we're testing individual people to understand whether or not they have a change in their DNA that makes them more likely to develop cancer. So that, that would be sort of like that would sort of an example of that would be BRCA. The, exactly. Know, yes. Testing for breast cancer. Okay. Yeah. I was gonna say BRCA testing for breast cancer is probably the most commonly known and talked about. And that's exactly what it is, where if someone has a change in one of their BRCA genes, they're at a higher risk compared to the general population of developing breast cancer and some other cancers in men, prostate cancer and women, ovarian cancers as well. Um, Though that type of testing is usually done on people for one of a couple situations. One is if an individual develops a type of cancer, like a young woman develops breast cancer, that is a trigger to test that woman for a BRCA mutation or other cancer mutations that lead to breast cancer. The second most common reason to do it is a family history. So it with a woman herself does not have, have a diagnosis of breast cancer, but if she has family members who have breast cancer, um, ovarian cancer, or prostate cancer, or pancreatic cancer, those can be triggers for an individual to get tested for a BRCA mutation, for example. And so the second sort of whole category of testing, genetic testing in cancer, which we aren't going to talk nearly as much about today, is testing the tumor. So at the most basic level, when I think about cancer, it's a cell that has turned on and it has lost the ability to stop. It's growing uncontrollably, and that is regulated by genes within the cancer cell. So whenever an individual develops a cancer, we can actually test their cancer cells and see what gene changes in their cancer cells are driving that cell to keep growing. Sometimes the genes that we identify in the person's tumor give us a clue that they might have that change in their whole body. So for example, BRCA being the same thing, you can find 
the BRCA first by looking at someone's breast cancer and then deciding to kind of work backwards and see if it's just in their breast tumor or if it's in their whole body. So those are the two pathways by which people tend to get genetic testing. And the, the latter, the testing on the tumor is really um, clinically, it drives a lot of treatment decisions, whereas mm -hmm. the germline testing is more screening, trying to either prevent cancer or, or quote unquote, catch cancer early to try and diagnose earlier stage cancers where we can have more success treating patients with fewer interventions. And so the tumor testing one, which is the, the second lane you're talking about, that would mm -hmm. be like, okay, have this cancer, let's test it and see what sort of treatment, what, you know, what the etiology is, correct? Yes. If you, I don't know if you've heard the sort of catchphrase of personalized medicine and oncology yes. much, but, but that's what we're talking about when we say personalized medicine and oncology. It's how can we match the best... Uh, chemotherapy medications to your specific tumor, not just to the general category of breast cancer, for example. And so the personalized medicine idea is, is we're not just making a guess that, you know, 70% of breast cancers have, respond to this particular medicine. We're trying to see, are there signals in your tumor that tell us it's more likely, more or less likely to respond to a particular medicine so that we can give you the medicine that we think is going to be most likely to succeed, but also minimize medications that are less likely to succeed and only give you side effects or negative effects of treatment. Can you give, um, can you talk about the landscape of <clears throat> diagnosis in increasingly younger patients? Have you seen an increase in pediatric diagnoses among your patients? So that's a great question. Um, the it is a very alarming trend that we've been seeing over the last number of years in the country as a whole of an increased diagnosis of cancers in young adults. Mm -hmm. So I would say people in their 20s, 30s, 40s are getting cancers that we used to only see in people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And that is uh, well documented, but very poorly understood at this point. So we don't really know why we're seeing more colon cancer in young people in their 30s, for example, or breast cancer in young women in their 20s. Um, we haven't truly seen that effect trickle down into the pediatric population, but what we are seeing is, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when someone is diagnosed with a cancer that sometimes triggered triggers checking to see if they have a mutation in their body that made them more likely to develop that cancer, the cancer predisposition syndrome. Almost universally, a young age at a diagnosis of, for example, breast cancer or colon cancer is an automatic trigger to do that testing. So when we're seeing these younger adults, 20s, 30s, 40s, getting diagnosed with breast cancer and colon cancer, they are appropriately getting this germline testing. And we're identifying more people who have these cancer predisposition mutations. What's different about that is that people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s tend to be the people having babies and growing their families. So people either have young children, we're talking about parents of young children, or um, young adults who want to have children and families. And so the diagnosis of the cancer predisposition syndrome in the 20, 30, 40-year-old is then cascading down into their children or thinking about uh, potential future children and what risk that would look like and what ways there are to try and mitigate risk for future children of having a cancer predisposition syndrome. There are so many stories of young women seeing their doctor with concerns only to be turned away because of their age or because they don't look unhealthy. With the pervasive gaslighting of women seeking medical care, how would genetic testing even come up in a conversation with a provider? It's a tough issue is my, my starting answer. And I think uh, one of the, the most important pieces is being an informed patient. So in an ideal world, cancer screening should be a part of every conversation of every uh, health maintenance visit that a, an adult goes to. You know, we should be talking about for women in particular, you know, when are you due for a pap smear? Have you had your pap smear? Like when do mammograms start? When do colonoscopies start? But to your point, those often don't start until 40s or 50s with right. the pap smear aside, you know, mammograms and colonoscopies. So that 20 to 30 year old uh, group of women are sort of can be 
lost in that shuffle because the the routine cancer screening conversation hasn't come up yet. Ideally, there should be a family history that is taken at every visit, and there should be the ability for the provider who's taking care of them to have tools built into their electronic health record, things that are already existing that can help them be doing screening to identify their young adult patients sooner to identify who they should be offering this cancer screening to. I will be very honest, the biggest challenge is that this field of medicine, the genetic testing, is rapidly evolving. Every six months or so, there are new clinical guidelines that tell us who should get tested, who shouldn't get tested, when should they get tested. And so for clinicians in practice, it's it's it requires a champion. It requires someone in the practice who takes on understanding uh, the screening recommendations and sort of owning that for a practice to make sure that the practice is as a whole sort of meeting the needs of the patient. And that brings me back to what I said in the beginning, like patient, it's never going to be more important to anyone than it is to the patient, right? Your own health is never going to be more important to anyone than you. Mm -hmm. And so being an informed patient and being a confident advocate for yourself is the best thing well, is a necessary part of the puzzle, at least today. Are so, you are you finding that um, insurers are getting on board in terms of paying for genetic testing outside of the the guidelines? I think that colorectal is now uh, age forty. Uh, if someone comes in with symptoms at thirty, are you seeing where the insurance is paying for it without a diagnosis? Do you mean for like a colonoscopy screening? Not a colonoscopy, but genetic testing. If there's a genetic predisposition in the, the family. Yeah, so that's a good question. I would say it it is also evolving quickly within the insurance market as well. I think the insurers are struggling just like the providers are to keep up with the rapidly changing information. From an insurance point of view, screening is a good thing right? Cancer screening is a good thing. Identifying people with cancer predisposition or risk and the ability to screen them and intervene early is a benefit because it leads to a longer term, healthier population. I think uh, the biggest challenge for insurers is the same challenge providers are facing, which is knowing which are the right patients to test. Mm. Um, And so that comes back to you know, knowing our family histories as best as we can, you know, asking questions when we're at family gatherings to get to know more about what is going on with everybody. And it doesn't have to be incredibly invasive health questions, but just knowing the general health of the people in your family makes a big difference to be able to advocate. I also think um, that there has been more science and research coming into sort of screening algorithms. And what I mean by that is being able to give some risk scores to people. Like if you have blank different characteristics, your risk of developing a breast cancer is 20%. And so that, and those risk scores lead to different recommendations. Those exist for some cancers, but not all cancers. And I think that's another area where people are trying to get smarter about how can we predict the people that we really need to focus on uh, before sort of the science and the and we're all ready for it to be just a universal recommendation. Hmm. Data presented at the American Society of Clinical Oncology suggests that hereditary cancer genetic testing is underutilized in cancer care. Do you agree with that statement? And if so, why is that the case? I do agree with it. And I think the the biggest reason, well, I think there are some different layers of barriers. The first one, as I already alluded to, is identifying the right patients to test. So it's not that hard to figure it out when you have a patient in front of you who's 25 years old, who was just diagnosed with breast cancer. It's easy to know that it's a flag for that person. It gets trickier when you're looking at a 60-year-old diagnosed with breast cancer because then you need to know a lot more nuance about her breast cancer, other family member history, and other things. And so one is clinics are busy and and it's keeping up with identifying the right patients. I, I do think another barrier is the confusing 
like clinical market for testing. So another issue that is difficult for practicing clinicians to deal with is that there are so many tests on the market available to them to order that it's hard to know which is the best one. So for context, there's over 175,000 genetic tests available to be ordered on the market in the United States. That's an overwhelming number for any practice to sort of keep straight and know how and when to use them. Even if we're gonna look just at BRCA screening for a patient, there's over 200 commercially available tests that you could order for your patient, which all would screen for BRCA. But as you can imagine, those 200 tests also have a lot of variation with them and what else they're screening for and how the whole picture pulls together. So I think there is sometimes like an indecision paralysis that can hit, hit clinicians, even though they want to do it, then it's hard to know what is the best next test to order. And as you alluded to earlier, sort of insurance coverage, these are expensive tests. So the average cost for BRCA screening tests is just under $2,000 per test. So it's important that uh, a patient's insurance is contributing to that cost and that we're not putting that whole cost directly onto a patient. But understanding which of those, again, hundreds of thousands or uh, genetic tests on the market a patient's insurer will cover is another whole layer of complexity. And I, I think so sometimes it just doesn't get done because there are these barriers in place to figuring out how to get the right testing done for the right patient. So you talked about the limitations of genetic testing. Let's talk about it against the backdrop of cancer risk assessment tools like tyrocrucic for breast cancer or CCRAT for colorectal cancer. Your colleague, Dr. Andrew Hurtler, talked about the breast cancer risk assessment tool being the future. What do you have to say about that? I, I agree with that sort of fundamental concept that these, these risk assessment tools are incredibly valuable for helping us try to continue to identify people who are at increased risk for developing cancer and so that we can think differently about them earlier on in their lives. What right now, the way that genetic testing sort of interplays with these risk assessment tools is that for patients who are above a certain threshold on those risk assessment tools, there is a sort of general recommendation to at least offer the patient the hereditary cancer screening for that particular type of cancer. What I think is important to recognize is, let's kind of talk through two scenarios. One scenario is that a patient on a breast cancer risk assessment tool scores where the score says they have a 20% risk of developing breast cancer in their lifetime. That would you know, trigger two sort of layers of things. One for that patient clinically, it would trigger increased monitoring above the routine mammogram. Uh, it usually would add in a breast MRI to screen more aggressively for cancer development. It would also trigger offering this germline genetic testing for a breast cancer predisposition gene. So in scenario one, the gene is positive. They, they decide to undergo the testing and the gene is positive. That okay. doesn't change much other than telling them what they kind of already knew from that score, which is they have a higher risk than normal. It may uh, help us know that they have a higher risk of other cancers as well so that we can add in screening for other things and it then cascades down into other family members where we can say, well, we can test if, if let's say that person has children or siblings, those other people can be tested if they want to be to determine if they also have increased risk. Scenario two is where that genetic testing is negative. So we even though the risk assessment score says that you're at you know a higher risk than the average population, the genetic testing comes back negative. But I think it's really important to understand there is that doesn't mean that the risk assessment tool was negative. The way that I take that is that there's still so much that we don't understand about what drives cancer growth that we should never tell that person, oh, that, that score was wrong, your genetic testing is negative, you're fine. I, I take that more as a deficiency of, we don't know the whole picture from genetic testing yet. There are certainly genes we don't understand yet or gene interactions that we don't understand yet where we would never want that negative to decrease the increased screening the patient qualifies for. Does that make sense? That makes sense to me. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, important. it's an important complexity of genetic testing that a negative test 
doesn't rule out an increased risk for cancer. You know, it's really more that a positive test confirms an increased risk, but a negative test to me just says only to the best of our current scientific knowledge right now. But if the overall picture, meaning looking at the individual and their family history tells a different story, that's the one we need to pay attention to. So, so how do you proceed in those cases? The the most important thing with genetic testing, in my opinion, is that we we are able to provide appropriate counseling about the results of a test. So it is so, so important and valuable to have genetic counselors be a part of a clinical practice or have access to the patients who are getting genetic testing so that they can give really uh, detailed and in-depth guidance about what the test results mean. Because again, a negative test isn't a, you know, wash your hands of it, walk away, you're scot-free, right. never have to worry about this again. And it's something that needs to be sort of gone over multiple times often with patients to help them understand what that testing really means. I think one worry people have and a, a poten potential reason why tests are under ordered is if the clinician isn't confident that they know what to do with the results. They don't want to order the test and then sort of have this result that they're not sure how to act on. Can you explain universal hereditary cancer testing? Is it the next step in genetic testing for hereditary markers? Sure. So when we talk about universal screening, you know, so far we've used the example of BRCA testing pretty right. extensively, and that's where you're looking for genes that are specific to breast cancer. Another very common one is uh, colon cancer. So there are a series of genes that we know are much more commonly seen in colon cancers and that those can predispose to some other things. There are tests now that sort of combine all of that testing, that instead of looking for just genes that predispose to colon cancer or just genes that predispose to breast cancer, they look at all of them. So they do both colon and breast, and then they also often include sort of anything else that we know is out there in the world of potential cancer or predisposition genes. And so it is a much more comprehensive test in the meaning, in the sense that if you're testing someone, this is going to tell you if there's sort of a signal in their DNA that makes them at risk for anything. It is also, again, the, the downside or the, the challenge is interpreting the results, right? A negative test doesn't mean that you're never going to develop cancer. It doesn't mean that you have no risk or that you don't still need your regular cancer screening and, and all of that. It just means that you don't have an increased risk of developing those cancers. I believe you asked if I think that that is the future. Yeah. I I think there's sort of a version of things in the in my lifetime certainly where everybody at least is offered more comprehensive genetic screening for a variety of diseases, cancers included. I think the trick is knowing what to do with the results and also recognizing that not everybody wants to know. So We've talked a lot about the benefits of screening and that it, once you know someone's at increased risk, you can do things more proactively to try and identify a cancer very early on. And in general, the earlier you identify a cancer, the more likely you are to both be able to cure that cancer long-term and to be able to cure it uh, by, by less invasive or less intensive means. So patients can live long, longer, healthier lives and also have to go through less for their cancer treatment. The flip side is there's a certainly a number of people who don't want to live with that risk, with knowing that there is this sort of potential hanging over their heads that they are going to develop breast cancer at some point or colon cancer at some point. Uh, some patients will describe it as like, I feel like I'm a ticking time bomb. You know, it can take away a lot of sort of day-to-day -day joy and can be really, really troublesome for some patients when they just feel like they're just waiting to get that bad life-changing news. I'm glad you brought that up because studies uh, show that children who receive a diagnosis have higher rates of anxiety and depression. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. I, I'm familiar with that research and I have seen it clinically as well. So as I, I mentioned earlier, with the increase in 
young adults of childbearing potential and who are young parents being diagnosed with cancer and then being diagnosed with cancer predisposition syndromes, we see that trickle down into the pediatric population, particularly to their children. So there is an increasing number of uh, pediatric cancer centers that have whole clinics now dedicated to pediatric predisposition syndromes, where they see a number of children and, and whole families where all of the children are at increased risk for developing cancers. And that is where there is a huge impact on a child to know like that they are just sort of waiting for the C word to come is how it's often described. They've, you know, children have often heard the word cancer and they usually associate it with death. And so the idea that they are just waiting for this to happen, it's huge. Um, these clinics almost always as a best practice have integrated into them pediatric uh, psychologists whose purpose in the clinic is to try and help children and families navigate those complicated feelings of this is an increased risk. This is something we're watching for, but you know, trying to not let anxiety or depression about it overtake children. It is a very real consideration. And I, I believe that the same is true in adults with cancer predisposition syndromes, even if it's not as well documented. So I don't see any reason why it would be scary to a 10 year old and not scary to a 20 year old, a 30 year old, a 40 year old or a 50 year old. Uh, and, and I don't know that we have a great way to handle that right now. You know, for women with a breast, uh, a BRCA mutation, it also isn't a guarantee that they're going to develop breast cancer. You know, the most recent statistics would say that women with a BRCA1 mutation, I think it's between 50 and 60 percent will develop breast cancer by the time they turn 70 years old. You know, for the BRCA2 mutation, it's a little below 50 percent, but by the time they turn 70 years old. So first of all, that's not everybody. Having the BRCA mutation doesn't mean you're absolutely going to develop cancer. It just means it's a higher risk. And it also, you know, that risk is over decades. And so that can be daunting. Imagine getting that diagnosis at 21 and you're looking at the next 50 years waiting for your cancer diagnosis to show up and it may never show up. So it's a it's a tricky thing. Um, so a lot of the ones particularly that will impact children, you know, they're at increased risk to develop a brain tumor. Well, we can't just take out your brain, you know, you, you just have to wait and see. And so it is a much more sort of at surface value. It's like, well, of course you'd want to know. And of course you'd want to do this. And then when you really sort of dig into it, I think it becomes a much more nuanced personal choice on need, needing to really understand kind of what everything is. And there, in my opinion, is not a right or wrong answer to wanting to know your genetic risk for cancers. It's truly a personal choice. Well, I'm glad there's mental health support um, in the backdrop for situations like this because it, it can be daunting. You're right, whatever age you are. Mm -hmm. What changes in policy or innovation do you believe are necessary to ensure genetic testing leads to better prevention and treatment strategies for patients and not just their children? I think, you know, as you alluded to earlier, insurance coverage. So in uh, having more universal and integrated guidelines clinically available to direct us to the best people to test usually impacts insurance coverage. So the more unified we can be as a scientific community and the more agreement that we can come to across groups or different clinical stakeholders who are all thinking about a particular disease, the more that unified scientific voice can then impact policy in terms of access. I think that's step number one. And what I mean by that is for example, like the American College of Breast Surgeons and the American Society of Clinical Oncology and the, the geneticists are pretty close in agreement about breast cancer screening, but they may have like slight nuances in who they would screen. The more that we can unify those groups who are all looking towards taking care of the same group of patients to an agreement of what are best practices in using cancer screening testing, I think that unification helps policymakers realize this is sort of clear-cut medicine, right? When there's really wishy-washy clinical guidance in the scientific community, it opens the door more on a policy side for there to be much more variable coverage because then the, the people making the decisions about coverage get to decide which 
which scientific point of view they want to side with, if that makes sense. So this unification from a scientific community can drive that policy. And then I think ensuring coverage for appropriate patients, just like patient advocacy groups have lobbied very well to now make it where mammograms are preventive health care, right? They're covered on our health plans where colonoscopies are supposed to be standard screening preventive health care. Genetic testing has a role to be in those same buckets, at least as an option. For patients who choose not to do it, that's okay, but the, the choice shouldn't be made because they don't have coverage for it. Do you guys work with patient advocacy groups to, to sort of drive this uh, home in terms of policy? Um, not currently. I would say that in, in women's health, the breast cancer advocacy groups are sort of worlds ahead of a lot of other cancer groups. Um, for, you know, the last number of decades, there have been really powerful groups of women who have come together to push this. And I think that they, that's a great model to look at for other cancers. It, it really, though, it has to come from the patient groups first, mm. if that makes sense. Like there, they have, there has to be a really strong patient community before a partnership with the scientific side makes sense um, because they have to sort of have their grassroots network activated in order to then affect at the policy level, the changes. So I think the scientific community can provide guidance on what changes make the most sense, but it's really the the patient communities are incredibly powerful advocates when they are organized. So we talked a little about uh, ethical considerations. Well, we talked a lot about ethical considerations. How important is it to test children? Um, and what are the potential benefits of identifying genetic risk early in life? That's a great question. And uh, one interesting thing is that there is a very strong belief that it is unethical to test children for a cancer predisposition syndrome that won't affect them until they're grown up. So uh, a single BRCA mutation is a perfect example of this. There, It is generally considered unethical to test, for example, a five-year-old for a BRCA mutation because the cancers that come from a single BRCA mutation don't come until adulthood. And the idea there is that while the parents may very much want to know if that child, if their child has a BRCA mutation, the child doesn't have a voice in it, right? A five-year-old cannot in any way understand the complexity of the decision that comes with knowing your cancer screening risk. So for anything that's identified in a parent who has a young child, we typically will see them and have a discussion about what this means, but we will defer testing until the child is, at least right now, 18. Um, and so that the child can have a voice in whether or not they want to be tested. And this again comes down to the not everybody wants to know. Um, and, and that I think is very hard on the parents. I think for parents in that situation, it is generally unsatisfactory. They want to know the answer for their child. But I think again, with lots of conversation and education and explaining the rationale why we aren't testing most children in those situations, parents at least understand that perspective and that the child can make a decision when they're older. The times when we do test children are when there is a potential like that a gene mutation in a parent, if inherited in the child, can develop cancers earlier in life. So whenever there's a situation where we know that there is a parent who has a mutation and any type of tumor can show up in childhood, we do recommend uh, testing the child for that gene mutation. The alternative to testing the child is just screening them like they have the mutation. Uh, and and that sort of as you alluded to has big downsides for all of the uh, all of the anxiety that goes around doing any sort of additional screening. So our typical approach would say, well, let's figure out if the child does or doesn't have the genetic mutation. If they don't have the genetic mutation, then there's not a reason to do any additional screening for them for a particular mutation that we know a parent has. Um, 
And so those situations are different. And if we identify children who have those mutations and they typically go on some sort of routine screening, uh, it depends again, very much on the gene mutation and what cancers they are most likely to develop in different age ranges. Dr. Sadie DeBrosi, thank you so much for shedding light on genetic testing. I really appreciate this uh, illuminating conversation. Yeah, it was lovely to talk with you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Urban Health Weekly today. I hope you'll join me and my friends next week so you can stay informed and inspired to take control of your health. See you next time.